Welcome to the Know It Some podcast, bringing you the widest variety of conversational interviews for a well-rounded perspective on life. Because while it's true, nobody likes a know-it-all, it's also good to know it some. Here's your host, Steve Platt. That's right. Welcome back to the Know It Some podcast. I'm your host, Steve Platt. And my guest this week spent almost 30 years serving his community honorably with the Miami-Dade Police Department from 1990 to 2020, the last almost four of which he led the department as its director. And under his powerful leadership, the department took huge steps forward, both in combating gun violence as well as improving community relations. He stepped down from being Miami-Dade's top cop in January of 2020 to enjoy a well-deserved retirement, just in time for the worldwide pandemic and lockdowns to take hold. Former director Juan Perez sits down with us this week for an eye-opening conversation on law enforcement that you won't want to miss. You'll see why this man is so deservingly well-respected nationwide and globally. Please welcome my good friend Juan Perez. Hey, Juan, how are you doing? Welcome to the Know It Some podcast. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, really have a good conversation with you today and uh, and partake in your show. Thanks. It it means a lot. For the listeners, you were the the director of the Miami-Dade Police Department for for about three and a half years until you retired. And uh, you spent almost 30 years with the Miami-Dade Police Department. And uh, I guess the logical first question, I guess the, the logical starting point for, for our conversation is I, I wanted to know kind of what inspired you to become a law enforcement officer. Like, when did you know that you were going to spend your career serving the community? Well, first and foremost, Steve, you know, it was a, for four years as director, it was a pleasure to really uh, be at the helm of the uh, department. The, the department that I think is probably the, the, one of the best departments in the, not, not only the country, but in the world. Um, and I've had I had a blessed career for 30 years, um, you know, and, and that that career that I chose, really, I, I like to think of it as uh, really a calling that some, something drew me into that career. And I like to say it was part of the, you know, it had to do with the values and the ethics that my parents brought me up with uh, to work hard, to serve our nation, serve our community in some way and to pay back into this great country. And uh, it was either military or law enforcement for me. So I gravitated towards law enforcement, um, you know, with my studies into criminal justice and then eventually entering the department. But, um, you know, I like to uh, think of it the other way around, right? The, the, the career chose me uh, as my path, as my goal. And uh, I truly look at it like it's a calling for me. You know, and, and you did a, a great job from, from all accounts. You, you know, it's funny. Uh... You're, you're lauded by many of your peers and, and those around the country. The, the department, you mentioned, you know, what a great department it is. And uh, it's a massive police department. I mean, we're not talking Mayberry uh, PD here. This is, uh, you know, I was looking at like the list of specialized units and I stopped counting around like 38 because you don't just have, you know, a homicide and, and bomb squad. and this, You have marine and aviation and underwater recovery units. H- how do you manage a department that's that massive of, of that size where there's so many different moving parts, so many different teams and you're covering, you know, uh, I don't know, like, uh, what was it? 2,500 square miles or something like that. Uh, how do you, how do you manage such a large police force and, and keep on top of everything? So, so yeah, Miami day police department is a very large agency to your point. Um, um, and, and, you know, many of the surveys were like, uh, the eighth largest uh, municipal law enforcement uh, in the country. Um, we, we function as a sheriff's department, uh, serve the entire county, uh, upwards of 2.8 million people. So um, as uh, a functioning sheriff's department, uh, even though we're metropolitan and we really function as a city police department, um, we have that dual role. So that's why the department is so large. Um, I, luckily for me, I, I had a, a lot of exposure in different units uh, within the agency. And as I went up the ranks, I tried to um, collaborate with a lot of those units and really get to know the other uh, specialized units and, and, and what our expertise are and where we needed, uh, you know, a little help and where we needed to really combine a workforce, 
uh, force multipliers by joining uh, partnerships with other agencies and leveraging relationships. So um, throughout my career, I, I had those opportunities, um, you know, especially like working at the port, my uh, port of Miami and Homeland Security, you know, even the robbery bureau, it forces you to go really even from not only inside the department of work outside the department with other entities, whether law enforcement or private industry. So those experiences really helped me um, as I moved up the ranks uh, to really have a good grasp of what the department's capabilities are. And I was one of, you know, you know, I was one of one that, that I always believed that you never uh, have somebody do that. You're not willing to do or haven't done it yourself. So, you know, with that in mind, I tried to do as much as possible, even uh, when I rose up to the ranks, uh, ranks and go to the trainings that the officers were going to, attending uh, their, their, all their scenario-based training, the classes, and really integrate myself into the many aspects of the department. And uh, that way I had a, a well-rounded knowledge of the capabilities and it, and it makes it a little, a little bit easier and then, of yeah. course, having good relationships with that command staff so they can carry your message. So so it's really almost like having, uh, I guess, uh, the ability to delegate, too, I'm, I'm assuming, amongst all those different teams. And and then I'm, I'm guessing you have a, a pretty good reporting structure there uh, under your command. Working with all those different specialized units is, is one thing. But then, like you mentioned, you function a lot like a county sheriff. So there's a lot of different municipalities that have their own uh, police departments, right? And so you're having to to work with them as well. Is is that one of, you know, uh, interference and funding for jurisdiction, or is that more of, of you guys lending support to to them when needed? Like, what's that relationship like between you and, let's say, you know, Miami Springs PD and you know, um, the the police departments in in all these different neighborhoods all throughout the county? So internally, uh, and, and you made mention of. Uh you know, having that command staff, you know, having the relationships, the structure. Um, we're really blessed that the people that came before us uh, in law enforcement um, set us up for success and set up a strong structure. And then every director that came on afterwards, you know, tweaked uh, and modified the structure as they fe felt was uh, best suited for the times or for the needs or, or the challenges ahead. And I did the same, but really the foundation was there. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that whatever successes the department had uh, were truly not because of me. It was truly because of the men and women that are in the front line, in that tip of the spear, that are truly making the contact with the people and making change. And then, of course, those that I surrounded myself with, the command staff of all ranks, that really helped carry the message and continue to do so even after I've, I've left the department. Um, so we had that... that strong relationship within the department. And as far as externally, when we look at the other agencies, the many municipalities in Miami-Dade County, um, because we are the sheriff's department, um, we provide a service to every single municipality, whether it's a sheriff's service to include any, uh, any uh, issuing of subpoenas and serving warrants and, and your traditional court services functions um, to assisting and aiding them with uh, operations um, some of the municipalities, they hire our law enforcement. Our, our officers are contracted to patrol in some of the municipalities. So we have relationships with everybody. And the one unique thing um, that, I, that Miami-Dade has that not many people know because they're not in the business, they just wreak the successes of Miami-Dade's partnerships. The one unique thing about Miami-Dade is that I haven't been able to find anywhere else in the country is the relationships, the strength within all the organizations that are here from the feds to the locals and the strong partnerships in the Miami-Dade Chiefs of Police that include the feds and other organizations where the top chiefs, the top dogs of each agencies come together on a monthly basis to exchange information and, and partner up to deal with the many different uh, uh, concerns within the community. Because the one thing we can't forget is that the criminals don't respect borders. So they're not gonna say, we're not going into Coral Gables to do a burglary today. If they're doing a burglary in unincorporated Miami-Dade, which is our responsibilities for patrol, tomorrow they may enter Coral Gables to do a burglary. 
So it's important that we work together as, as law enforcement within this massive county with a multitude of agencies uh, to, to really protect our, our citizens, our residents, and our visitors. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because you mentioned uh, the federal agencies. I'm assuming that you guys have close ties with them, that you have liaisons within the department that coordinate closely with uh, the FBI. You know, I'm watching now in, in my area down in Northport, the FBI is working very closely with that police department to, to try to find, you know, Gabby Petito's killer. Uh, it, it just seems as though uh, Miami is such a, a large city uh, that it's not just a, a national cooperation, but also, you know, an international city, right? And then uh, I'm assuming when uh, there, there are events, when the president comes to town or other things where you have to coordinate with the, the Secret Service. So are there like designated liaisons within the department that, that deal with each of these agencies? Well, one of the benefits of having an agency the, the size of ours is that we have personnel to be able to lend to these agencies to be part of task forces. And these federal task forces are, are crucial to, to uh, any successes that the department has in fighting uh, specialized um, specific crimes, right? So if, whether it's violent crime, dealing with guns, we partner up with ATF. There's four squads assigned to ATF wow. that help them address uh, the, the gun, uh, you know, you know, all the gun violations that are out there from trafficking to sales of guns that are illegal in the streets. Um, they're a big part of our successes of fighting uh, violent crime to partnering up with the FBI, whether it's for homeland security matters, whether it's cyber crimes. Obviously, DEA, you know, drugs, Miami's always been that hub of drug activity uh, coming into the country. So, you know, without that partnership with the DEA, Homeland Security Investigations, Coast Guard to patrol the waterways. You mentioned Secret Service, and, and a lot of people don't realize that Secret Service isn't only about protecting uh, dignitaries, right? The president and, and, and high-ranking officials. Secret Service also has a multitude of investigators and they're one of the highly, highly regarded uh, investigative entities when it comes to uh, identity theft and frauds and, uh, you know, stolen credit cards. And they have incredible capabilities to help solve those type of crimes. So through th that partnership there is critical for us. So we have personnel assigned to the, the Secret Service. And I guess I, I should say I had personnel and the department has. So it's hard for me to detach from that role uh, when I speak. But um, yeah, we, we, we benefited and we continue to benefit from those partnerships, um, specifically with, you know, the, the, the bigger agencies, right? The more common ones, FBI, ATF, uh, we, we really have a great relationship with them. And, and yeah. at a personal level, some of the greatest training opportunities that I had uh, came from partnering up with these agencies and, and specifically with the FBI and, and having opportunities to, uh, to, to do a lot of uh, a lot of fun stuff, but very important stuff and joining different committees on terrorism and, and, and counterterrorism and travel around the world to see how other people uh, fight terrorism. So uh, great opportunities there and um, great stories of successes that, that occurred um, while I was with the department and continue to happen now. You know, we only get to see a small sliver of it as a, as a public, but now in the age of, of technology that we're in, with social media, there's there's a lot of outreach that it seems that you guys are doing, both as a department, uh, yourself as, as a leader. How big is that, both in, in terms of a tool for law enforcement, utilizing technology and social media, and then also as an outreach uh, mechanism? Like, you know, how, how big is that? Because I'm assuming that that took uh, uh, some, some steps forward under your leadership. Well, you know, it was, when I was at the FBI Academy, I, uh, one of the projects that I, that I took on was to write a a policy for the agency on uh, social media. And I brought that back to the department as deputy director and uh, the director, J.D. Patterson, uh, liked the policy. And uh, we, with, you know, the legal bureau and some others, we, uh, we, we, we mastered that policy, what I like to say, called mastered it and uh, really catered it to our department's needs. And we rolled out a, a robust social media platform. Um, when I became the director, I, I really thought it was important because it was some tough times that, you know, and, you know, the law enforcement was getting beat up, you know, and, and it comes in phases, but we were getting beat up at the time when I became the director. And uh, I, I thought it was important that we leverage um, the social media technologies out there so that we could put out our own story. Because if you don't put out your own story, somebody's going to write it for you. 
So yeah. um, with a very creative mind that uh, became a, a chief of communications for me, Hector Yavat, um, he led the efforts in, uh, in really um, putting us in the forefront, I believe, uh, on social media. And uh, soon after, people started following, all the other agencies started following, and I think the entire county now is doing a great job, all law enforcement agencies, and pushing out information. But really to, to put out a, a positive story on what occurs every day in law enforcement, uh, weekly recaps, and then when we fail the community, and you know, by one officer that may have made a mistake or a bad decision or bad judgment, that we were able to go on that same social media platform and really provide that statement to the community to, to let them understand that it's being dealt with, you know, because perceptions are key. And if uh, you don't come out quick and uh, in today's day and age and, and put out a statement that you're not paying attention, you know, it makes it look like you're not paying attention or you just don't care or, or you're going to let things uh, pass without addressing them, that will become perception. And, um, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, community you got to win the community over and and have them trust you and have confidence in you not only as director but for the entire department and uh social media allowed us to to get to where uh, i believe we had one of the strongest relationships with the community um probably in, in the in the history of the of our department and that's one of the things that i think people respect most about you is that you you made it very very clear that a your department holds itself to a high standard, right? And you put out all, all the good things that you guys are doing throughout the community and you get that message out there through social media. But by the same token, like you said, when, when that bottom whatever percent acts up, you guys have held them accountable. And what's, what's you know, and I know from the military that not every Marine uh, held themselves to the right standard as a Marine. We, we, we saw it uh, all the time. And not every law enforcement officer in the nation, not every single one is going to be perfect. But when you guys had a, a, a bad actor make its way into the ranks, you were very, very clear. And I believe you said no one's above the law. And that's one of those things that you got out there. You, you made sure that there was no mistaking it. And a, as a result, where other municipalities might hit the news all the time in Minneapolis and different places. My, Miami-Dade, uh, at least, you know, in, in recent times, has kept itself out of that fray because of the way you guys conduct yourselves, which, which is really, really admirable. But people, people only see, right, the bad incidents, the bad incidents that make the news because the hundreds of other incidents that go on on a daily basis don't make the news. And, and I think you guys have done a great job with social media in that line, Juan, of things that people don't see, I wanted to bring up uh, uh, maybe a tough subject, maybe an emotional subject, because I, I don't think people see the, the dangerous side of, of the job uh, as often. And so I wanted to, to take see if you could take me back to, to September 13th of, of 2007, Officer Jose Somohano dying in the line of duty, uh, serving his community. Uh, what do you remember about that day? and the days afterward? Well, it's a, it's a lasting memory. It's very vivid still to myself and, and to those involved, you know, and uh, it, it was an operation that uh, I was leading that day as a lieutenant of a general investigations unit, um, really to go after individuals with guns and gang members and uh, try and slow down the number of burglaries that were occurring in the south end of the county. And, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, um, that day, you know, shortly after uh, we broke from our, our briefing, um, you know, Jose Somohano, his partner, Chris Carlin, came across an individual that, that fled from them on foot. And, you know, now showing the story, but, uh, you know, it's much more detailed than this. But uh, the, he was able to make it into his residence and, uh, and acquired, uh, you know, was able to, to get to his AK-47 as the uh, foot, foot pursuit was going on and the officers had split up to kind of set up a perimeter while backup was en route. And um, Jose Somohano crossed the path of a, of, of a very elongated window. And I say that because all, as officers, we always try and avoid the windows, but this window was about one foot up from the ground. It went all the way up to the ceiling mm. and uh, there was no way to kind of go around that. He was trying to cover that front door. So as he passed that front door, this individual, uh, you know, shot the AK-47 through the through the window and struck him four times, 
And um, Jose Sumahana was basically cut in half practically by the round that went through his hip. And uh, he dropped back. And um, then he came out. Um, and the accounts from a witness is he was wearing his bulletproof vest. Uh, the bad guys wearing bulletproof vest, gun in his waistband, and uh, AK-47 in hand. And he pumped six more rounds into Jose's uh, upper body and, uh, mm-hmm. and and took his life, you know. And then he engaged Officer Carlin and uh, I shot at him multiple times, injured him. Uh, the car, the rounds uh, went through three cars that were parked there side by side because those rounds are just uh you know they, they call these things choppers for a reason right he chopped right through the cars and uh, uh chris was hit with fragment throughout his legs and he exchanged gunfire um a couple of the officers came up also just trying to get to jose at this point they're just trying to you know extract the body just trying to pull him out evacuate him and uh you know two other officers were were shot and uh, the end result was uh we we lost uh we lost an officer that day um, another officer, Jody Wright, um, still to this day, this happened in 2007 to this day. She's still having surgeries on that leg. Mm. She lost three and a half inches of bone from that AK 47 and two other officers that were also shot, uh, were able to recover, um, you know, fairly, uh, easier compared to, uh, to Jody Wright. But, you know, the, the mindset of an officer, the mindset of a, of a warrior, you know, the, all three went back to work and uh, Jody right at the hospital, you know, even though she was missing three and a half inches of uh, bone uh, in her leg, you know, and she had pins sticking out of them and she was in a wheelchair. She told me, uh, give me a light, a blue light and a gun and I'll go out there tomorrow again. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But, uh, but yeah, th- those moments are, are very trying moments um, because you, you know, obviously you work very close together when you're in a specialized unit and, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we, we hear about the PTSD that, are, that you know, from the military, right? Because from exposure yeah. to to violence in short periods of times of these uh, in, in, in wartime and, you know, in battle um, yeah. in law enforcement, you have some officers undergo PTSD in those because of the moments like that. But oftentimes we call it the drip effect. It's like the faucet dripping one drop of water at a time. You know, it's an entire career of 25, 30, 35 years of experiencing things like this. And then the next day having to come back to work again and then perhaps having to handle, a, a, you know, a, a scene where a, a small child was shot and killed, um, you know, or a domestic violence where somebody was stabbed. And, and it's a continual trauma that officers see. And uh, it's a it's a drip effect when it comes to that that you know PTSD, that tr- constant trauma over an, uh, a long period of time. Uh, well, so yeah, difficult time. L- let me ask you about that. So about the drip effect, because I witnessed during your time in leadership, uh, not just those day to day tragedies, but but some major ones that made news, like the the bridge collapse by FIU that that um happened, uh, I believe, during your time as director. Yep. Um, and, and other tragedies that happen. And, and, you know, since your retirement, we've, we've seen more, the Surfside condo collapse and other things. I mean, in a large city like Miami, things happen, you know, it's just a, a numbers thing that things are going to happen in a large city like that. Uh, tragedies, uh, just, just difficult things to, to see. And then of course your life is on the line in a lot of cases, I'm sure in your career, there were probably times where, uh, you came close to, to some danger as a family man. Right. I just have to ask you, how have you dealt with the drip effect? You, you personally, as an officer, a law enforcement officer over almost 30 years, when you deal with tragedy, when you see, you know, absolute pain and devastation in, in a member of the community or you lose a, a fellow officer, how, how have you learned to deal with that? Well, you know, that, that, that's a, that's a, that is a great question because oftentimes um, people don't want to deal with it or they try to ignore it. Um, and, you know, and going back to like officer shooting and so forth, um, you know, the more difficult thing is not even being in the situation where you're before your fellow officers, but is dealing with the family mm. and having to explain to the family, to wives and kids and husbands, you know, that someone's been injured seriously or that someone's been killed. So, that, you know, you know, it's not even only the incident itself, but then dealing with the family members, right, that, that you know, are in a in a state of shock and then you're having to deliver. 
yeah, you have to deliver that message to them and and uh, and let them know that hey, you know, unfortunately, an operation that I ran, you know, your husband was killed in, and you know, then watching the kids cry and it, it's trying and and uh, and it will wear you down. Um, mm-hmm. With the Jose Somohano incident, uh, you know, I chose you know the spiritual route, you know, and I had a good foundation of friends um, that were involved in a in the Emmaus group through the Catholic church. And I, I leaned on them for, for uh, support and, and guidance and, and able to talk to them about it. But there has to be an outlet, whether it's a psychologist, counselor, um, a fellow peer, there's gotta be an outlet so you can talk this through. And we're in a much better place now in law enforcement, at least in Miami Dade, other places aren't as lucky, but we, we are in a much better place where people do come forward and we have the resources in-house that are, are, are available for officers in need that need that you know help when they see trauma or even when they're having personal issues or when they're having addiction problems to alcohol or you know anxiety or, or anger. So we have those capabilities in our agency and it's much needed. And uh, because in the past, it was something that was not recognized and it was kind of looked at like if you're weak, if you came forward, if you if you weeped, if you uh, shed a tear, if you gave a hug, it wasn't looked at as part of the job where I think now that part has kind of diminished. That wall has been broken down a little bit and people are more open to sharing and seeking help when needed uh, because, yeah, it is the drip effect. And if you're not careful, that drip is going to turn into a bucket of water and you're going to be drowning in it. It's so important what you just said, because, you know, if that wall continues to be broken down and, and things continue to, to move in that direction where where people are able to talk things out and kind of be a little less anxious, I, I think it leads to better law enforcement. I think it leads to better law enforcement officers. Absolutely. Um, you know, Absolutely. And, and I think uh, some of the, the very unfortunate incidents that, that we've seen around the country, um, officers make a, a poor decision on this national news. I think it, it might be a result of an officer who might have had good intentions when he set out but unfortunately the the anxiety that the drip effect the the ptsd those things kind of set in and take over if you if you don't address it and, and you know if you let it i was going to ask you what some of the biggest challenges facing law enforcement today were but i think that might be it in, in terms of the drip effect are there any other challenges or is there any other aspect of law enforcement that the average person might not, not might not realize, might not be thinking about right now, um, uh, or or maybe is there an area that you think is is going to be a big challenge for law enforcement going forward um, for the future? Well, right now, you know, you mentioned that you know, officer wellness is uh, is at the forefront of uh, what you know the major police departments are trying to get in front of, right, and, and trying to get ahead of because it's important that officers' uh, mindsets are at a, in in the right place because. If you're angry about something, where it's something personal, or you've been watching the news and all you do is get, you know, you hear, uh, <laughs> you're getting bombarded that all law enforcement are evil and they're bad, and you you will carry that with you out there. And one one you just shut down and you no longer do proactive police work, which harms the community, and uh, you know, and or or two, you instead of slowing down, you you escalate to a level where you shouldn't be, and now you're you're short tempered, right? So. Yeah. So officer wellness uh, from the physical aspect of it, making sure people are physically fit to be able to deal with the stress to the mental aspect of it and, and, and highlighting to officers um, to self-identify what issues they have, how to deal with problems, when to come forward, to look in the mirror and look at their own faults and weaknesses. All this makes us better people, period, yeah. which in turn makes you a better law enforcement officer because we're people, we're human. And, um, you know, so that that definitely is one challenge. Um, and of course, the the uh, the other challenges we, we touched upon it with a little bit earlier with, uh, you know, with with social media, I would say media in general. If you don't have a, a good working relationship with the media and you embrace the media and, and you partner with them and you use them um, to your benefit to put out information on crime, but to also have those hard discussions when things don't go your way, to have those discussions about why crime is up, why violent crimes are occurring, why there's shootings. If you don't take the time to partner with the media, then you're failing because what the only news they're going to see is that perhaps George Floyd was killed by a law enforcement officer 
in Minneapolis and you're going to feel the effect here, yeah. which, which happens oftentimes throughout the United States where all these cities, you see riots and all types of protests when it didn't even occur in their community. And at sometimes they have great relationships with their own law enforcement, yeah. um, but it goes unseen. So if you don't put out that narrative, uh, you know, and partner with the media and, and communicate through all necessary means out there, um, radio, podcast, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, your, your nightly media, uh, news, your newspapers, your online. If you don't do that and put yourself out there and, and are not known to the community, they're not going to trust you because they don't know who you are. So, you know, and, and, and you're just the figurehead. You're facilitating as a leader of the agency. All you're doing is really is being a facilitator yeah. and carrying the message for the department. And, and when we started, we talked about the tip of the spear, the yeah. men and women that are on the street making the contact. I always tell them when I have the opportunity, even today when I run into them, the officers, or when I was the director or the deputy director, those last seven years in leadership, you know, the top two positions in the department, I would always tell the trainees that were coming through the academies that they're more important than the director of the police department. And they would look at me and kind of you know smirk, and I would tell them, no, you're more important because I can sit here in front of a TV camera and in front of the audience, the commissioners, whoever you want to choose, I can sit there and tell you this is how we do things. And if you go out there and do it differently, they're going to know your name. They're going to know our department because of you, not because of what I said. Yeah. And the perfect example is, you know, everybody, you know, not everybody, but a, a vast majority of people can probably uh, pick out out of a lineup uh, the officer involved, uh, Officer Chauvin. Um, you know, they know his name. They know what he looks like. The, the, the dealing with uh, George Floyd, the officer that yeah. killed George Floyd, right? Yeah. So does anybody know who the chief of police is? No, yeah. not a single person. So he leads the agency. He's the leader of that agency, but nobody knows who he is. So who's more powerful, the officer on the street, the tip of the spear, or the guy that's in the shaft? <laughs> you know, well, that's yeah. <laughs> well. So so look. For, first off, when, when these incidents hit hit the the national media, right? A lot of times we don't have the full story, and when we do have the full story, and we see that uh, injustice occurred, we're only seeing that injustice and not the hundreds of thousands of other interactions between law enforcement and the community. That being said, you talked about how law enforcement can get in front of it, how law enforcement can get the message out through social media, through the media, podcasts, um, and, and what they can do to better relations with the community, what they can do to be better law enforcement officers and dealing with drip. That's on the law enforcement side. On the side of the civilian, on my side, on the side of my friends, when we do see something that angers us, frustrates us, uh, you know, the George Floyd incident, because I'll be honest, that one enraged me to see uh, what that officer did. When we see that, what's the best way, the most productive way for us to affect change, to voice our frustrations, to be heard by law enforcement, to interact with uh, your department for the betterment of law enforcement relations going forward and, and for the people who are, are uh, feeling as though perhaps they're being persecuted. There's got to be a better way than lighting cars on fire, breaking into buildings, you know, uh, looting, all that stuff, right? So what's the, the best way for them to affect positive change and bring about better law enforcement in their communities? Because not everybody has the law enforcement that we do in South Florida. Uh, you, you guys are exemplary, but, you know, if, if they're frustrated with their, their community's policing, what's the best way to affect change? Well, for one, one thing is, you know, you, you touched on it a little bit about, you know, the, the number of cases that occur that are bad or over the, the cases that the incidents that occur every day that go unnoticed because they just take a normal course. Yep. Um, you know, an agency like ours, and listen, there's about 900,000 law enforcement officers in the United States. And, you know, if, if everyone just made like two contacts every time they go out there and shift, you do the math of how many contacts there are, you know, and, and millions of contacts. And, you know, for our department alone a year, we, we handle about 800,000 calls for service, plus all the other contacts that don't are, are not called into dispatch because yeah. it's a, a quick stop and an interaction. And, millions of interactions. Yeah. And, and you know, we, you know, for all those incidents, you know, 
we rarely get complaints. You know, we get about 200 plus complaints, uh, you know, uh, internal affairs complaints of, of, uh, of battery or brutality. And the vast majority of those are not founded. They're unfounded. And then uses of force themselves, we, we get about 200 uses of force a year for an agency our size. Which and, you know, what you, yeah, what you see, you know, overwhelmingly is a very, very uh, small part of a percent of cases that really go bad um, that make the media, unfortunately. And it takes a narrative of its own because it continues to play. So yeah. as a citizen like me now, you know. <laughs> I have to pause, right, before I make judgment, before I cast judgment and let things play out a little bit because oftentimes it's not what it seems, yeah. you know, and then there's a whole backstory and then you got to put yourself in the situation of that officer and not to justify, but yeah. to kind of just put yourself in the same mindset and to kind of determine of how that could have happened. But here's the best way is to get involved. Every law enforcement agency out there that's, a, a, you know, accredited law enforcement agency has um, partnerships with different community organizations. It's really to get involved so you get to know your officers, whether it's a community advisory committee like we have each, in each police district, um, whether, you know, it's, it's a police athletics, uh, you know, going to the police aca uh, citizens academy. There's many different ways that you can get involved so that you have that relationship with the law enforcement, even through Crime Watch and all these other activities, because then you get to know the law enforcement officers, you get to experience who they are, you get to know them, they get to know you. And then when something goes wrong and the officer was 100% wrong, it yeah. was that officer that was 100% wrong and not every law enforcement officer. Right. And, that's and, and, what, like, you, and like you said, you know, in, in an agency of your size, the, the amount of, of complaints and internal affairs investigation is, is, is such a small percentage. And then you go through how many are unfounded and you end up with just the smallest amount of of true, you know, bad incidents. And what I what I've seen, at least in Miami-Dade, is they're held accountable ones uh, above the law. But we're talking about millions of interactions where there's a positive outcome with law enforcement that, that never, ever make the news. Um, so, so, I mean, you're hundred percent, right. It, it, it's best to, to get involved. And, and also, like you said, take a, take a beat when, when these stories hit the news, take, take a beat and, and, you know, let it breathe for a second and, and find out all the facts before, you know, uh, you make judgment and on a, on a light note, I want to end it on a lighthearted note. Last question for you is going to be this Miami's a big city. There are a lot of sports teams in that city. If you if you had to pick one, I know it's hard picking up. It's like picking your favorite child. But if you had to pick one sports franchise in Miami-Dade County, who, who's your franchise? What, who, who are you the biggest fan of? <laughs> right now is not a good time to ask that question because I don't think anybody's doing that well. <laughs> 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 well, you know, a lot of these teams have had championships in the past. Uh, that's yeah. like a like a lose lose there, because uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we've had we've had a uh, you know, listen, we've been blessed as a as a community to have uh, some championship wins. Uh, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, you know the Dolphins are due because it's been a while, uh, but it doesn't look that way right now. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think uh, you know the vast majority of people. You know, we've seen the Marlins win a couple of World Series. We've seen the the Heat win and uh, be successful. Um, of course, we gotta you know look at the Panthers. Uh, uh, you know, they they got to the Stanley Cup a long time ago. Uh, but it's still you know they're a fun team to watch. You know, hockey's always a fun sport to watch at live. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, th this community here is. Uh, looking for a football team to uh to get them some wins and get them a championship it's been a while since um or or the dolphins have uh <laughs> really done anything at this point uh, i think we're ready for fiu to step up and uh and take the go. lead that, so that's, uh yeah. that's the top football team college football team in miami in my opinion uh judging by that game uh <laughs> yeah. by that game that they played in marlin stadium a, yeah. a few years back. yeah um, so so we're, so we're we're ready for them to take the lead. Nobody else wants it. So <laughs> there you go. So so you have it there. Uh, we're we're waiting for FIU to take the lead in football. So much Juan, I appreciate all your time. It, it means a lot. Um, for folks that want to follow you on social media, where can they where can they find you on social media? 
Well, I'm kind of light on social media now that I stepped back, <laughs> but uh, I, I do still have a Twitter account. I'm at uh, J Perez at uh, MIA is my uh, my Twitter account. That's Roger pretty that. much all that I, that I put out there. Every <laughs> once in a while, I'll make a statement, you know, but it's got to be something that really rattles me. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when, oh, FIU, uh, when FIU plays uh, Miami again, maybe we'll see a statement there. Um, you know, it, it means a lot. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And you're welcome back anytime. And that'll do it for another episode of the Know It Some podcast. My thanks again to this week's guest, Juan Perez, both for your time and for your insight. It is dialogue like this that is more needed. We need to have more of these conversations so that we can better understand each other. And I feel like I learned a lot from today's conversation, and I hope that you as the listener did as well. Folks, if you have not done so already, please head on over to Apple and iTunes, or if you're an Android user, you could also use Podchaser. Podchaser's open to everybody. And leave us a five-star ranking and review. It is the very best way to support the show, and it enables us to continue to book interesting guests each and every week for you. Folks, the support has been overwhelming. I cannot thank you enough. And another way to support the show would be to head to your favorite social media platform, follow us, like our posts, share them with your friends. We are at Know It Some Pod on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. We are there at Know It Some Pod. And you could always send us your feedback by sending us a message there or by emailing us at knowitsomepod at gmail.com. That's our email address, knowitsomepod at gmail.com. Folks, it's been a true pleasure. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next week.